Tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Shepherds fear and tremble when low upon the earth rang out the angels' chorus that held our Savior's birth. Go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Down in a lowly manger, the humble Christ was born. Brought us God's salvation, that blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. I'll sing that first verse again. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hey.
How's everybody doing? It's good to see everybody. And uh, if you are visiting with us, we're glad that you're here. As uh, we have been walking through Joshua, I haven't been teaching Joshua, but we've been walking through Joshua on Wednesday nights, and we're going to continue that tonight in chapter 4 of Joshua, if you want to turn there. Uh, But before we start reading, we're going to pray for our North American Mission Board uh, missionary. And so we have Jacob and Francine Zalian. And they are in Sanger, California with Set Free Church. And so they've asked us to pray for God to continue to reach the lost as our church serves those in need in our community and those facing homelessness and addiction. And so uh, it's a wonderful couple there who have surrendered their life to being a church planner in Southern California. So that's a, I believe that's a, uh, I was trying to think, Sanger, is that San Francisco or Los Angeles? I think it's Los Angeles, but I could be wrong on that. Um, but they're asking us to pray for them. And so, as always, we're just going to take a moment when someone feels led, just going to ask you to stand and pray for this family as they minister as one of our missionaries from the North American Mission Board. Thank you so much, Chris. All right, we are, as I said, we're going to be in chapter 4. And so uh, before we uh, dive in, uh, I just want to say, for those of you who've been here for the past few Wednesday nights, as Wes has been teaching, even though I am also Wes, but as Wes Orton has been teaching, um, thank you for allowing me a few Wednesday nights off to be able to catch my breath and get some things done that we need to get done. And then tomorrow morning, uh, I will have surgery, and so that will take place at about 7.30. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Sorry, you've been gone. You had surgery. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, but uh, so I'll have my left ankle corrected like the first one. And so uh, that, will, that will take place in the morning. And so looking forward, though, to the next couple of Sundays, Danny will be bringing the word the next two Sundays uh, with the Christmas season. And then Ronnie will bring it the third Sunday. And we just went ahead and put those on the calendar just in case there was any hiccups. We didn't have any issues. So thankful for that. But it was really good to be back in the worship center this past Sunday. So it's very good, and um, man, when you see Ronnie, Casey, Danny, um, Andy, uh, Johnston, uh, Cliff Horn, uh, Deidre Coggin, where's Miss Deidre's in here somewhere, man, she made that place look great for Christmas, and I know Tracy was up here, Diana Duncan, I mean, there was a lot of people helping with all that, so let them know how much you appreciate their work, and when you see Amanda Jackson, she doesn't know I'm telling you all this, if she's watching live stream, she'll find out. But so if, if you don't remember, back when COVID first started, we redid the foyer. And Amanda was put in charge of the colors and all the, the thought process in the foyer. And so when we did that, I told her, whatever you do in here, we're going to have to bleed into the worship center when we remodel the worship center. So just make sure it's going to look good. Well, Amanda did a really good job. So whenever you see Amanda Jackson uh, walk in the halls of the church, make sure you say, hey, I know you're not going to accept this, because she won't. She's going to say, oh, I had nothing to do with that. But it was almost every thought process in there was by her, you know, her initial setting. So it was really great for us in that regard. So make sure that you see that. And then this, uh, this uh, Sunday morning, we have a special recognition uh, that will happen early in the service. So uh, be here for that. But we're going to recognize Miss Nadia as she's been serving here. Last year during COVID, she was uh, here for 10 years. But because of COVID, we didn't do the uh, the tenure, the tenure recognition. So we're going to do that Sunday morning. And Miss Nadia and her family are such a blessing to our church. And so make sure you are aware of that. And uh, if you want to bring a card or something, we're, the church, of course, is doing some things for as a whole church. But uh, just so you're aware of that, that that'll happen Sunday morning at the beginning of service. So all those things are happening. And uh, man, it's just been a good day today getting some things done. And uh, as you prep, you begin to think, man, what are the things that I need 
to do before I have surgery. This is one of those ones that, like, I'm going to be up and able to do some things with my mind, but for a month, I can't put any weight on my foot at all. It's zero weight for a month. Um, and it's even a little bit longer than that, but that's the, there's no way, I'm not even in a real cast for three weeks, and then I go into a hard cast that I can't walk on. So it's a little while. And so how do you get everything you need to get done? And I realize you're never going to get everything you want to get done. But then you got to go, okay, what's the most important things that we have to get done? And then how do you keep in mind those things that are important? What are the things that after I go in tomorrow that I come out and I go, okay, these things still have to be done? Well, I don't know if y'all have ever seen in my Bible, but most of the time you'll find a lot of sticky notes and things like that in my Bible. I don't know if I left the, yeah, here's, here's some of my sticky notes from this past Sunday morning that I use. And then I have all these little stickies like this because that's my, that's my reminders. They go everywhere. You'll walk in my office and on my computer screen, I'll have sticky note after sticky note after sticky note. And they have all sorts of things on them. I know what every one is for. If somebody ever comes in and like uses a blower in my office and blows them around, I'm going to be in a lot of trouble. Okay, so, but the whole purpose of those to remind me of what needs to be done, even if I forget. Now, in your life, how many things do you think you have forgotten that God has done for you? Oh, I'm telling there ain't enough post-it notes. And I got a lot of post-it notes, girl. Man, what a hard application that is, isn't it? I mean, just think about how many things has he done that we have forgotten that he's done for us? We don't remember. Now, I'm not saying that to make you feel bad. I'm saying it because tonight when we look at Joshua 4, I know Wes has been talking about having a right relationship with God so that when he commands you to go, which is what happens in Joshua chapter 6 and following, when he commands you to go, you're ready to go. Because following God's command is always built on being a disciple and a person of prayer and a person who is rightly living. God is not going to pull, now hear me when I say this, he may save you and use you, but he's never going to take a person not living for him and exalt him to do great things for him. He is always going to take someone who is following him and trusting him and move them into a place of great influence. Now, that could happen very quickly. Billy Graham is one of those. Got saved on a, at a youth revival. He went for pizza, got saved. And the next thing you know, he's a 19-year-old who begins to preach, and we see what happens. And it never turned around. So it can happen very quickly. But the pursuit of God and knowing who God is in our life will always be the precedent or the preceding factor of God using us for his glory. And when we think about all the things that he's done, Many times we fall into a place where we just go back to the same old, same old because we don't remember the things that he's done and we forget. There's a scripture that says, lest you forget, correct? Mm -hmm. Saying, you should remember, okay? And that's what we see in Joshua chapter 4. So if you want to stand with me, we're going to read the whole chapter. I don't know if Wes has been doing this every week or not, but it's my practice, so it's what we're going to do since I am teaching and I get to say what we're doing tonight. So... Yeah. So Joshua chapter 4, let me get there. I turned the page and I didn't get there. Uh, say it with me if you know it. We stand in honor of God's word because it is his holy, infallible, inerrant word. It is completely true and trustworthy. It is necessary for the unbeliever to find salvation in Jesus Christ and for the believer to live a life of godliness. The Bible is the word of God. Church, do you believe that? And this is what the word says in Joshua chapter 4, we're starting verse 1. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, take 12 men from the people, from, uh, from each tribe a man, and command them saying, take 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you and lay them down in a place where you are launched tonight. And then Joshua called the 12 men from the people of Israel whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of tribes of the people of Israel so that this may be a sign among you. 
And when your children ask in a time to come, what do these stones or what do those stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And when it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And so these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. And the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan according to the number of tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and they laid them down there. And Joshua set up the 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood. Uh, and in the midst, uh, 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 sorry, and they are there to this day. And for the priests bearing the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord had commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Joshua, uh, Moses had commanded Joshua. And the people passed over in haste. And all, when all the people had finished passing over, the, Lord, the ark of the Lord and the priests passed before the people. And the sons of Reuben, the sons of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the people of Israel, as Moses had told them. About 40,000 ready for war passed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in all of him just as they stood in all of Moses all the days of his life. And the Lord said to jo Joshua, command the priests bearing the ark of the testimony to come out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, come up, out of the Jordan. And when the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came up from the midst of the Jordan, the soles of the priest's feet were lifted up on dry ground, and the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed its banks as before. And the people came out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east uh, border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took from uh, Jor the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, When your children ask, their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? You shall let your children know Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. And the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over. So that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty and that you may fear the Lord your God. And we're going to read the first verse of chapter 5. As soon as all of the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they had crossed over, their hearts melted and they were no long, there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this testimony in your word. And Lord, we thank you that you have given us your word to teach us. And Lord, we pray that you would use your word tonight to bend and break us so you can mold, mend, and make us more like Jesus. And Lord, I pray that we would remember what you have done and that we would not forget. And Father, that we would put into practice what you have commanded and that all around us would see that the Lord lives. We pray these things in your holy son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, because of the other things that I've been dealing with on Wednesday nights for the past few weeks, I don't know what Wes has all done, but I'm going to teach this chapter the way that I know to teach it in light, and we're going to go from there. So the first thing we're going to do, since we're taking a whole chapter, is I want to show you a little bit about this chapter, because when we read it, you probably were like, didn't we just read this? And then we read a little bit more, and it's like, well, didn't we just read this, okay? So this, this chapter is what we call a chiastic chapter. Okay, it's a literary device, okay, a chiasm. So what that means is, and I'm going to draw a first picture of you for you. So the first thing is, if I'm standing over here, and there's a mirror right here, okay, my reflection is right here. So that makes a lot of sense. I see my reflection there. Now, if I put Cami in front of me, a chiastic is like this. You have A and B, and then the mirror image is that B actually comes before A in the chiastic version, correct? So if I, I have Cami in front of me looking to a mirror, Cami's in front of me in the mirror. Okay, so that's how this, ver this, how this scripture is broken up. This is how, what we're going to see. So you have it in two places. So verses 1 through 14 is the first set, okay? So that's A and B. 
And then we get to verse 15 through verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, and that's what you would call B2 or B1 and A1. So you have that picture right there. And whenever we take this, you have a flow, and it's telling us different things, and it's going to push us a little bit further. Now, you can get real deep in this and see every little piece. We can't cover that. There's so many small changes, and when I say changes, they're not differences. It's just a little bit more detail when you get in there. You could chase that for a long time if you really want to go into it, but we're going to focus on some of the uh, some of the more prominent things that I believe that the writer wanted us to see as he took this up. So like I said, it's broken up. So we're going to go through 1 through 14 first. That's section 1. And we'll look at A and B in it. And the first part is verses 1 through 10. So it talks about how they were supposed to go. So they've already crossed the Jordan, or they're in the midst of crossing the Jordan, which y'all talked about last week, correct? So now they're crossing Jordan. There's some things that we got to keep in mind. The people of Israel couldn't come within almost a 1,000 yards of the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, so that's part of what's going on. So when they're crossing, they're almost three-quarters of a mile away from the Ark of the Covenant on either side. So the water has been shut up somewhere upstream, and the water is gathering up there. Okay, so that's what it means, that water has been held up north of where they're at somewhere because the Jordan flows from north to south, flows from the Sea of Galilee all down the valley of Jericho and goes into the Dead Sea, which is one of the lowest places on earth. And so it goes all the way down there. And so it's being stored up. Now, I am not sure how God stored it up, but God did. But that means somewhere upstream, somebody's looking at their floor going, it's wet because it's during the harvest season, it's rainy. So there's a couple of things about this miracle that's really intense. One, it's at the most... Uh, it's at the most saturated time of the year in Israel. When it says it's out of its banks, if you go up between Dayton and Liberty and you cross the Trinity River, y'all know those times whenever the river doesn't, it starts in Dayton and it ends in Liberty, right when you come off the bridge. That's what the Jordan looks like during this time. Now, another thing that we need to understand about this time is it's in, it, we talked about the 10th day of the third month. Well, that's March and April and it's during Passover. So that's really big because they're passing over the Jordan at the same time that many, a generation before they had walked out of Egypt at Passover and went through the water of the Red Sea. So God's using this miracle to show authority in this. He's using it to show the people that this is my chosen one to lead you in the next step. So that's another thing that we see that's coming out of this. And so as they're walking, we have all these things happening. It's dry ground. So whenever it talks about 40,000 people crossing, they're crossing in almost a mile-wide stretch of property that's dry. Now, it doesn't mean that they didn't get mud on their feet or something like that. It just means when they put their feet down, it was on ground, and they didn't have to swim across, okay? So the Jordan is stopped. They're crossing over, and Joshua has this command that the people of Israel are going to take one stone. And this is the focal point of it and how I have post-it notes. The whole purpose of these stones is to be a memorial or a reminder. And it's a massive thought process. It's something we've got to be able to dive into and say, listen, okay, God, what, what am I supposed to bring out of this? Well, tonight, I didn't know this was going to happen, but a family in the church, Rhonda and Henry, sweet people, who serve, they gave us, me and Rhonda, little gifts just for, I guess, Pastor Appreciation Day, and they, they gave me this. And one of the things that they, the thing that they gave me is a journal. That's going to tell you, I was not planning on that. I didn't know they were giving me something. But that's part of remembering. The reason why people journal is not so they can write something for their, I mean, their kids may read it one day, but you journal for a reason to remember things. You want to know what happened. That's why people cut out newspaper. My grandfather had newspaper clippings forever. I mean, it was like, good grief. And some of them were like, why do we have this? And he would look at me, he was like, because it was a fishing pole for sale. I just forgot to throw that away. And we're like, we're going through stacks of it, and there's stuff like that. We're like, oh, good grief. You know, how are we ever going to get through this? But he wanted to remember things, so he started doing that. So as they go over, they have these 12 stones they got to pick up, and they're going to take them. Now, 
the first set, he says, listen, you're going to place these over here, and whenever your children ask you, what do these mean? Now, I want to point out something to you in verse 6. It says, when your children ask in a time to come. So first, the expectation is, is that you're going to raise your kids knowing that God has moved. That's the first. There is not a person in this room that, has, uh, that is exempt from teaching the younger generation that God is alive, that God has worked, that God is working, and that God will work. Everybody in this room should be teaching that to our children, to each other, and to people younger than us. Why? Because in one generation, things are forgotten. If you go back to uh, the time before the Exodus, whenever Joseph was the second in command of all of Egypt, that's how Genesis ends and everything's going well for the people of Israel because they get one of the most fertile areas of the Egyptian Delta, Nile Delta. They are able to raise crops. Pharaoh was in good terms with them because Joseph had saved the Egyptian empire. And whenever the drought came, remember the whole dream and all that stuff. And so Joseph is high in command. And it says, then came a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. And they enslaved the people of God. That's how it ended. That's where the slavery came from. It's because all of a sudden the things that Joseph had done, that God had revealed to him, and the hero who Joseph was, was now all of a sudden, well, he wasn't really that big a deal. Who was this guy? Who was he? And the Pharaoh didn't know him. And so all those people now become a cheap workforce. In fact, they become a slave workforce. And so that's what happens to the people of Israel. And they have to go through 400 years of being prisoners in Egypt. Well, with us, sin does the same thing. When we forget what God has done for us in the past and we forget, it allows things to happen where we say, oh, what is that about? And we can fall into a slavery with the same sin over and over when we forget how he released us. Case in point. I know people who have been in debt and out of debt multiple times. They get in extreme debt. And they are, and I'm not talking about what I call, you know, normal debt. Like I have a, I have a payment on my house or I have a payment on a car or two. I'm talking about like they've, they've bought lattes and they're paying for them 20 years later at 24% interest. Oh, yeah, it happens. Y'all know it happens. Some of you in this room kind of like, okay? So uh, it happens. And then, Man, they'll get, they'll pray about it. They'll set their, their mind on scripture and that, man, the, the, the debt, I mean, the, the, uh, you're a slave to your debtor. Yeah, I mean, you're a slave to your lender. And so they'll get all that in order. They'll start living according to scriptural guidelines for finances, that you live within your means, that you give God what, uh, what he calls us to give, which is sacrificially, not just 10%. It's above and beyond. It's when you have it and God calls for it, you give it. That's, that's the way God calls us to give. And so they start walking through that. And next thing you know, they're like, hey, we're, man, look what God's done. Through the truth of his word, I, I am no longer in debt. And then five years later, they're like, oh, my goodness, we got stupid again. We had to go here, and we had to do this, and we had to have this, and we didn't know how to And then this happened, and we hadn't saved money for this. And they're right back in it. Why? Because they forgot. And they didn't put in place something to remind them. And their children are seeing this, and their families are seeing this, and people say, and they are seeing it. And so in verse 6 it says, what do these stones mean to you? A memorial driving down the road don't mean anything if you don't know what it stands for. So I love driving by the San Jacinto Monument. I love seeing it. I love whenever you're coming over Cypress Bio, you can look, and if you look right down that, there's a right of way right there of I-10 where when you make it, I don't know if they planned it or not, but it's perfect. It's right in the middle of your viewing lane for about, I don't know, 30 seconds, and then it goes away. And it's crazy that you can see it because you feel like, well, I can't see it from here. Why can't I see it right here? It's just because of the way the angle is. But I love San Jacinto Monument. There's a lot of people that go, well, it's just this monument. Eh, a battle happened there. No, a battle didn't happen there. Texas was born there. God's country is from there. I mean, 
They, didn't have, they couldn't do it in San Antonio. They had to come over here and do it in Houston. That's the, and fight in the mud. And so all that stuff happened, though. And if you, like, you, you know what it means. You understand what it does. But it, it's not just about San Jacinto, though, is it? They just brought up the Alamo. And their chant was, remember the Alamo. And at the Alamo, it was, remember Goliath. And so as you remember all these monuments, these things that we've placed in our life, in our national state history, you, you build this love for what actually happened. Because you understand, man, people died in Goliath, people died at the Alamo. San Jacinto was a quick victory, but it was years and years of just taxation without representation, and nobody's perfect. The settlers weren't perfect. The Texans weren't perfect. But being now, when I see that, it reminds me of something. It makes me grateful that we live in a very conservative state that hopefully the Supreme Court will overturn Roe versus Wade, and the moment that happens, abortion becomes illegal in the, in the state of Texas. I'm thankful for a state like that. And so when I see things like the San Jacinto Monument and the Alamo, when I drive up 45 and I see Sam Houston stand there, which was not a nice man, but I see him there. When I go to Austin National Cemetery, which is the, it was the Texas National Cemetery back in the day that's on the east side of 35 in Austin, and you can walk in the graves of some of the, one, the, the first settlers, and you can be in there. I heard, you just know. You go to Independence in Washington on the Brazos, and you see all the history that took place there. And then even beyond that, you go to D.C., and you see Lincoln Memorial, Jefferson Memorial. You see the Washington Monument, which is shorter than the St. Jacinto Monument, just for the record. Y'all know that story, right? If you don't, here it is. So we put in to have the monument built, and they said it, you can build it, but you can't build it taller than the Washington Monument. So they had it redrawn that the, the sphere was shorter by like eight feet than Washington Monument. They said, okay, we sign off on it. So they got federal money for it. They build it, and they just built the platform another 12 feet up than they originally thought, so now it's taller than the Washington Monument, but they got away with it. So that's, that's Texas for you right there. So, so that's how that's taller. Um, but when we go, we see all these things, and it's a reminder of what's happened. So here's the question that I had for myself, and I tell you all this all the time. I'm only using the questions that I feel like God put on my heart to speak to me to speak to you. If your children, grandchildren, or your neighbor came in and they were to walk through your house, what in your house would they see that they go, man, that's what they told me, taught them, like that's the representation of what taught them, or the, like that porch on their front swing, I mean that, that swing on their front porch, <laughs> maybe they've already started drugging me up for this thing, I don't know, um, <laughs> that swing on the front porch, that's where, they, that's where they have their quiet time, that's a special place for them. How much would our families even know about God and what he's done in our life by even the things in our home? We're willing to put up monuments all over our country to remind us of what it took to get us to the place that we are today. What are we saying in place? And I'm not just talking about like a physical, like, hey, I have to have this sitting right here. But why not? Why don't we have things that remind us? No, we were at a meet and greet uh, the other night. Uh, it was uh, the Jingle and Mingle, I think is what they called it, at the Gray's house last night. And uh, Rhonda and I have been over the Gray's house numerous times. And their front and bathroom, right in the front, there's a Post-it note, which I love Post-it notes. So I, I was like, hmm. And I know what those are for because Rhonda puts them up for our girls. And, and she has some on her mirror. And every once in a while, I'll get a little Post-it note on my mirror at the house. But in there it says, do your quiet time today. Your time with God's important. That's all it says. You know, that's a monument. Because when I walked in, I knew exactly what was important to those parents, to those girls. And that's the same thing that we have. Joshua's asking, them, what does it mean to you? I'm not responsible to teach your children or your grandchildren or your neighbors why God's important to you. You're responsible to take Christ to your neighbors and to your children and to your grandchildren. You're the one that's supposed to be able to say, this is why Jesus is important to me. This is why. Because back in 19, 
I don't know. I don't want to age anybody in here. I mean, I could say the 1800s, and Melvin still applies. But, you know, it's like back in the 1980s, and my family was going through a hard thing, and me and my wife were not jiving together, and we thought it was all over. But we have this reminder here to remind us of where we were and where God brought us. It's the same thing of why we wear a ring, right? It's to remind us and to show everyone what does that other individual mean to you. Because only your spouse means that to you. And so he's very pointed in it. That little phrase to you, in a few minutes he doesn't repeat that line. But at the very beginning, not in the reflection, in the actual command, what does it mean to you? Can you answer that question? If somebody's to ask you, why is that cross in your yard? Why is that Bible on your table? Why is it important that you sit there on that front porch every day? What are you doing? Why are you mumbling? Are you okay giving the answer? And what would you say? When I walk through our home, I'm thankful that I have a wife that, one, is a good decorator, but, two, that we love Scripture in our home. Because Scripture is always the constant reminder of who is truly in charge. I may be the authority of the house on earth, but he's the authority of the house. And so Scripture is a good way to do that. But what does it mean to you? So as he keeps on going down, it talks about how they did it. It's a memorial forever, and it talks about what they did. Now, I want to key in on two phrases. In, uh, the first one is in verse 10. Uh, as you get close to verse 11, it says, So the people passed over in haste. So this is a picture of them walking through an impassable barrier by God's miracle into what God has given them. Okay, so the Jordan is, especially at this time, an impassable thing. Now, how many of y'all, and some of y'all too old to remember this, and that's hard to say because Oregon Trail's old now, but we remember Oregon Trail, old school, computer game. How many of y'all played Oregon Trail? Okay, see, they're going to get this. <laughs> the rest of y'all, you aren't going to get this. Y'all remember you had to ford the river? You either had to get a ferry, ford the river, whatever. Every time you tried to ford it, you sank. It was pretty much, it was almost impossible to cross it without taking a ferry. That's how the Jordan River is at this point, like we talked about earlier. But he uses a phrase, and I don't think it's by accident that the Hebrew changes phrases from here to here. The first thing he wants to point out is that God's always the one that moves us from the impossible into what he's promised. So he is taking a people who can't cross it, providing safe passage in a miraculous way into a promise that only he can give. So what's the promise? The promised land, where the people of God are supposed to be his people, ruled by him, in fellowship with him, to be an example for all the world to see that he is the living God. Correct? That's what the promised land was supposed to represent. So what's the barrier? The Jordan River. It's impassable. They can't do it. What's the problem? The people are on the wrong side of the barrier. So what is this a picture of? The cross. You have the promised land of a relationship with God, not heaven. Remember, our reward, our greatest gift is not that we get to go to heaven. It's that we have fellowship, relationship, and uh, access to the creator who loves us enough that while we're on the opposite side of a barrier called sin that is impossible to pass on our own, and it would take the one who promised relationship, the one who promised us that we could have eternal life, the one who promised that he loves us, had to provide the miracle for what we messed up. Remember, the people are on the wrong side of the Jordan River right now because they had messed up. That's the reason why they're not in the promised land. Because when the two spies went in, Joshua and Caleb, which now Joshua is at least 40 years older, they came back and they said, God's with us. We got this. The other 10, nope. So that's how that all works out. So the whole reason they're on the wrong side of the barrier is for their sinfulness. 
And so this is a picture of the cross, and he uses this word passed over because in Christ, the wrath of God, when Jesus died, that expanse was covered for us, and the wrath of God passed over his people. It's just a picture of the gospel. When people say the Old Testament don't preach the gospel, it preaches it every time you read it. Because God's always been in the business of doing what we couldn't do for ourselves because he loves us and because he's a good God. So he says it passed over. Now, there's some things about obedience here that I think we need to pick up on in verses 12 and following. It talks about these people coming over, the, Ru- the, the sons of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Now, why is that important? If you remember, whenever they were about to take the promised land, there were three groups that said, hey, let us keep the land on the east side of the Jordan, but we'll come help do what we're supposed to do in the promised land on the west side of the Jordan. This is those three groups. And Joshua says, remember what you committed to. Remember what you said you would do. Now, this is one of those moments that I struggle with because we are not saved by works. However, our works show if we are saved. Isn't that what James says? You show me your faith without, what, you show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my works to show you my faith. That's what James says. So faith without works is dead. So what Joshua is calling these people to do, and as they go over, it's, hey, I remember what God has done for us, and we made a commitment, and no matter what it costs us, because now they're on the east side of the Jordan, they're going to cross over, and it's only, like, we think of distance in Texas distance, okay? We get a map, and we see a space about that big, and we're like, that's like six hours, you know? You go up to Rhode Island and Massachusetts, you get a space that big, that's like right next door. You know, it's just how it is. It's, we think in Texas thought process. Well, Israel's a lot like Rhode Island thought process. It's you from the Jordan. If you're up on the, on the um, bluff of the Jordan on the east side, if the walls, which I believe they were, were as tall as they said they were, you could have put a light on top of the wall and seen it from where they were standing. It's only like seven and a half miles. It's not that far. So these men have made a commitment, and they're safe. Their families are already building homes. They're already claiming land. They've got their sheep in their pasture. They've got their goats in their pasture. Everything's good. And they are still having to say, okay, we committed to following and doing what God called us to. And we can see the enemy. They're well fortified. They still were the giants that they had heard about 40 years earlier. The people of Canaan hadn't changed. And they're still going to do it. Why is that important? Because so many times when God gets us out of a pickle, the next thing we do is forget what God did, and we just say, okay, we're good. You ever notice you praise in the mountaintop, you cry out in the valley? And we don't often praise in the valley and cry out at the mountaintop. Because when everything's good, hey, it's all good. That's why Americans struggle to become believers. And why half Americans who think they're believers are really not. Because they're just good. God's happy with me because, look, I got clothes, food, good job. That's just general mercy. That's all that is. It's just general grace. It's him giving you things you don't deserve and withholding the things that you do deserve. And he does that. It rains on the just and the unjust alike. That's what the Bible teaches. And so this group, though, it's just a picture of being true to their word. And when we say we have sold our life to Jesus, we have given ourselves to be a slave to Christ, this is a picture of what they said, God, no matter what it costs us, we may never... I mean, you got to think about what these men are doing. They're going to cross not knowing if they're ever going to return home to see those babies and those wives again. Because they're going to war. This wasn't just, oh, yeah, we're good. We'll get you over there. We're going to help you move the piano over, and then we're coming back. This was the real deal. So it's a picture of being committed. Now we get to uh, the very last part of the first section. And it says, on that day, the Lord exalted Joshua. So this is the very inverse of part B. So what we have is we have the memorial instruction and then the actual crossing uh, in verses 11 through 14, and 14 wraps it up, and it shows what happens in Israel because of what God had done. 
It says, on that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him as they stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. So that's how Israel was affected by this miracle. They knew who their leader was, and they remembered who God was and what he could do. So that's what happened. So now we move in to B1 and A1. So now we see the actual crossing, and then they'll have the memorialization uh, a little bit later on. So verses 15 through 18, we've already talked about the Passover statement. But then whenever you get to 15, and it changes over, that was in 14, uh, 13 through 14. When you get to 15, it changes in how he talks about the crossing. So this crossing is Passover. Well... That's how he describes crossing the Jordan here, okay? But in the second time that he talks about the crossing, what's the word that he uses? Anybody see it? It's actually two words. You see it in verse 16, verse 17. Verse 18. What does it say? Come up. Come up or come out. Okay, what in the New Testament... So. I'm going to come up or out. When in the New Testament did Jesus say that to somebody? Come forth is what the New Testament King James Version says. So what we have is now a picture of salvation in a different light. Now it's, hey... You're in the river. This is, I'm going to pass you through the river to the promise. Now it's, you're in the river, and I'm going to make you come alive from death. It's just the opposite side of salvation. He's using a different way of looking at it. So now it's, you are dead on this side because you're dead in your trespasses, right? That's what the Bible says. For all have sinned, correct? There's no one righteous, no, not one. But while we were yet sinners, God loved us so much that he sent Christ to die for us. Okay? So that is the picture of come out. There's no reason that this verb should change right here. Other than the gospel of Jesus is preached all through the Old Testament. And so he says, hey, come out. So we see it over and over. Command the priests who are bearing the ark of the testimony to come up out of the Jordan. So... Who rose from the grave first? Who's the first from the grave? Jesus. He is the first among the resurrected, correct? He is the firstborn. Not just the firstborn of all creation, which is his title as the creator of the earth, but he is the firstborn of the resurrected. He is the first of the resurrected saints. And so coming out. So the Ark of the Covenant, remember, is a picture. It is God's presence with the people of God. So where the Ark went, That was God's presence. When it was sitting in the temple, the presence of God rested in the temple. When they went and picked it up, don't get close to it. Stand about a thousand yards away from it. Only the priest can get close to it, and they have to wash ceremony. You touch it, you die. Why? Because he's holy, and it's his presence. So what came out of that grave, a man or God himself? God himself. The presence of God came out. So in this, under the water, what is baptism? Death resurrection. It's just pictures of Jesus the whole time. That's why I love the Old Testament, because it just teaches you more about Jesus. And so he says, come out, and it comes out, come out of the Jordan, and then it says, in the midst of Jordan, the soles of the priest's feet were lifted up on dry ground. Where there is no way, he always makes a way. And the waters of the Jordan were put back in their place and overflowed all its banks as before. So when the miracle happened, when God had completed what needed to be done, The world goes back the way it is. Isn't that how it's been since Jesus came? The only difference is the presence of God is with the people of God. But the world is still doing its thing, and there's still a barrier between anyone who doesn't know Jesus and God himself. And that's what every week we want people to realize. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, that you made that decision, not somebody else, not your parent. It doesn't happen to baptism at birth. It doesn't happen because somebody says you're okay with God. It doesn't happen because you've been in church your entire life. It doesn't happen because you can, I mean, I know people that can tell you more about Scripture than I can, and they will tell you I'm not a believer. 
but they know Hebrew and Greek and they love biblical thought process just because they think it's a part of history. And they'll tell you, I don't believe in Jesus, but this is an incredible document. You can know this backwards and forward. You can attend church. You can do everything that it says, and you can be as lost as anybody that you would name this lost. But it's all about, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Did you make that decision? The Bible tells us very simply that if you believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, that he was actually God that could com complete the payment for our sin, and that he could defeat death. That's what it means by that you believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead. And you confess with your mouth that he is Lord. That's not just Savior. That's I give him everything the rest of my life. I will be obedient even whenever it hurts me to be obedient. That's Lord. If you will... Confess with your mouth that he is Lord. Believe in your heart he was raised from the dead. Romans tells us you will be saved. And it's followed up by that same picture that we saw of those people. What I committed to God, I will continue to do even if it costs me everything. That's what that picture is. So it says that the people came out the 10th day of the first month. That's, uh, like I told you, this is three days before Passover is supposed to happen. So they're all in that mindset already. And they camped at Gilgal. Now, Gilgal is important. This is just kind of historical. Uh, the people of Israel had four sacred sites, I mean, three sacred sites before Jerusalem was taken over. Uh, you have Shiloh, you have Shechem, and you have Gilgal. And Gilgal was the base camp of operations on the, west, on the east side. And then you have Shechem up north and Shiloh a little bit uh, further uh, into the mainland than that. So that's how you have these three places. And so Gilgal's there. Now, interesting enough, we don't know how he made this monument, but it, it may have been a small pillar. It may have been a round circle. The reason why we think it may have been a round circle is because Gilgal means circle. Okay? So that's why we think it may have been some type of structure that had some kind of circular shape. And so they took the 12 stones and they let them out there. Now, why is he doing this? Why is he doing this A, B, and then back to B to A? So you had... Here's what we're going to do. We're going to memorial, here's how you're going to memorialize it, and you're going to, cross, you're going to cross the actual activity. Now he's the activity, and now you're going to talk about the memorial again. Why do you think he talks about the memorial last? Why, don't, why, did, why is it not A, B, A, B, or why isn't it just A and B and just leave this all out? I think it's because, one, you get... God paid for our sin, and he delivered us from death. Those are two messages that are clearly said in this, in this passage. Second, I believe it's because remembering what God has done is really important. Now, I don't know about you. The last thing that I say to my wife every time I leave the house, if she's not asleep, even though I still walk over there and give her a kiss on the forehead or whatever and tell her, she may not hear it, is what? I love you. Why do I do that? Why do you do that? One, I'm not promised two minutes from now. What's the last thing I want my wife to hear from me, even if we've had the worst day together? I don't want the last thing that she heard from me is, man, I just don't understand you. Every guy in the room knows that's a true statement because it's, it's a ladies. That's the way it is. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the last thing I want her to hear. I want her always not. But I also want her to remember that's, that's the most important thing. It's the reason why we say it often. It's the reason why we have a ring. It's why we have three kids. Because we love each other. And whenever he brings this back up, he could have just bypassed. He already told, they've already crossed it. He's already told us about the memorial and crossing wire. Now we're talking about crossing. It's because the last thing we usually hear is the only thing we remember. And the writer of Joshua understood the, the brain. He understood people's attitude. Man, the things that God's done a long time ago, y'all have already told me the truth. There's a lot of things we've already forgotten that he's done for us. We don't even thank him for them anymore. 
And he says, you got to remember. you got to remember. And he repeats that same question when your kids ask, what do these stones mean? Not just to you. What do they actually mean? Will you remember? I'm thankful that Rhonda and Henry Hernandez gave me a journal that I would be able to have here. I hadn't even thought of it, journals. Maybe you need to start investing time just saying, what did God answer today? Put a date, put a time. When God says something to you, maybe you need to find a way that you keep that, you, you log it somehow. One of the things that I love, there's a gentleman named Dr. Edge. His name's Raymond Edge. He's the pastor at First Baptist Church of Bastrop, where I was a youth pastor. And Dr. Edge has this prayer journal, and it's not anything like crazy hard. It's basically like, it may say like Wes's ankle. And it has something else, somebody else's. And it's just prayer requests that he hears of. And then on the other side, it has a date. And then there's another little space that has a date. And the first date is when he started praying for it. The second date is when it was answered. And they're highlighted. Because every time, he said, every time God answers a prayer, that's a highlight in life. Not a birthday, which we often celebrate. Not an anniversary. He goes, those are all things that we celebrate. Man, the creator of heaven. I'll never forget when he said this. I don't even know if he would remember saying this. The moment that the creator of the universe reaches down and impacts my life personally, that's a highlight of life. You ever thought of it that way? That the creator of the universe takes a moment and goes, it's a powerful thought. What I love about that journal is when I saw it, there were some prayers that the starting date was well before I graduated high school, maybe some of them elementary school, and they had the start date. They still had the end date yet. And he's still praying. But he wants to remember the things that he asked of God and how God answered them. Just a challenge. Are we sitting down at night? Um, I still think about my... Uh, are you sitting down at night? Are you telling your kids, you're telling your grandkids, you're sharing the time with your wife or your, your husband, just saying, man, this is what God did today. Even if they're small, hey, he gave us another day. I mean, those are big things. But we often just look at it as another day. But when I think about things that just told me what's important in life, my grandfather's chair, when you walked in the double glass doors. They had a, the glass sliding doors underneath their carport at my grandmother's house. And um, you would walk in and up against the wall, there was a rock fireplace over here, the TV right here, a couch, and my papa's chair was sitting right here. And on papa's chair, I mean, beside papa's chair was one of those old school uh, couch side tables that had the bigger platform that had a little stand and it had the small stand on top you could put the lamp on and the telephone. That's what, that's what was there. And on that bottom part was a crossword puzzle, was his pipe and ashtray because he smoked a pipe. And, and those are things that like when I walk by a tobacco shop that has pipe tobacco in it, I, it's pawpaw. You know, that's, that's what I'm actually. Why? Because I remember. But on that top spot, there wasn't a phone there it was a huge, large print Bible that was falling apart. And it didn't matter who came in those doors. He would say, hey, come have a seat. Now, if it was one of the grandkids, we knew where the seat was. The seat was on the armrest between him and that table. And he would put his arm behind you, and he would pick up that big Bible, and he would sit it in my lap or my brother's lap or my cousin's lap. And he would open up that Bible, and he would say, hey, let's just read for a moment. And he would read just whatever. He always went to an Old Testament story. He knew little boys would like, you know, David and Goliath and Jonathan shooting the arrow, you know, 
Saul almost killing David with a spear. You know, he would always read those types of things. I was really kind of like, oh, Papa, I didn't even know that was in the Bible when he read about, you know, the lady putting the tent spike through, through the king's head. I was like, hmm, that's a little grotesque. You know, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm probably like six years old, and I'm like, hmm, that was fun, Papa. Um, he really did read me that story, and I was like, what are you thinking about, Papa? <laughs> like, I, I want to go home. Um, but he would read that. But every time he came in, it didn't matter if it was somebody that we had brought in. He'd say, hey, have a seat for a moment. And they would sit on that couch. He'd say, hey, do you know what this is? Yeah, it's a Bible. Do you know what it says? Well, yeah. Okay, tell me what it says. And I'll tell you, there's something about that Bible that sitting there, it just reminded us all the time about what truth was. There's a place not for idols but there is a place for the things that God has done in your life even the hurtful things that you've done that God has changed your life from now the Bible says that God separates our sin from us as far as the east is from the west okay now we often misinterpret that saying that we don't ever have to deal with consequences anymore we don't ever that, that's not a true statement what it's saying is, is when it comes to our righteousness declared by Jesus Christ, through the blood of Jesus Christ before God, our sin has been separated from us as, as far as the east is from the west. But you know, there's times to remember, man, I walked in this way, and God corrected me, and this is my reminder. Because I never want to go back. I never want to go back. Does it remind you of some of the hurt sometimes that you either caused or the damage you did to yourself? Absolutely, but sometimes that's the reason why. When you get injured, the pain is what reminds you you're hurt, correct? And whenever that pain's not there, you're like, oh, I'm so glad that's not there anymore. But you know what that pain felt like. So sometimes we need to be very dedicated to saying, man, I need to remember this. You may have to get something. You may have to say, hey, I'm going to put this little thing on my nightstand just so when I see it. I have a friend of mine that carries a rock in his pocket. It's just a rock, nothing special. I asked him one time why he carried a rock. He said, well, whenever I was in college, I did everything that I wanted to with any lady that I could find. That was just my lifestyle. He said, then the Lord got a hold of me. And he said, and I got married. And he said, my heart wanted to follow God, but my mind often wandered. And he said, one of the things about that rock is it has some little sharp edges on it. And it's hard. And when I put it in my pocket and I stick my hand down there every once in a while, I go, ow. He said, but every time I do it, I go, man, that's who I was. I don't want that. I don't know how many times that, walk, that rock has probably been washed because if he's like any other guy, he gets left in the washing machine, probably clanking around in there. But there's nothing wrong with those things because it reminds us we need to remember what God has done for us. Sometimes those are in the blessings and sometimes the things we don't see as blessings, but they truly are. The conviction of sin, the turning of our life around, those things. Whenever the people of Israel would go back and the children would go and they would see those stones and those kids would ask, I oftentimes think about the things that maybe were said in, in Bible stories. You know, those parents would have to say, you know, like, kids, this is where we cross. You see how they're out in the water right now? Because it says he put it in the midst of the, the bed. So it probably was on a place during dry season. It would come out of the water, but during wet season it would come back up. Because it was a reminder, one, God stopped that whole river. That's how those rocks got there. It was very physical evidence of what happened. But two, it's a reminder that we were supposed to cross this river years before, but we didn't do what God said. And your grandparents never got to see the truth, got to see the blessing, the pain and the reward all at the same time, but faithful to teach and to remember. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for your word. And Father, I thank you how you have passed over us with your wrath because of the blood of Jesus Christ. 
and that whenever the Holy Spirit calls our name, that in Jesus' name you say, come up out of the grave, and that you give us life again. Father, may we not forget those things. May we not forget the, the things that we take for granted every day. May we remember. And Father, forgive us how we build memorials to remember things like championships in Little League and completing a marathon, which are big things on this earth, but they mean nothing in the one to come. So Father, may we, if we need to, make ways to remember the highlights of life when you reach down and you touch our life. And we thank you for Jesus, which has given us everything, and the Holy Spirit, who's here to bring God, I mean, bring conviction and God and direct us. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would do that and remind us often of the goodness of God. We thank you for a Savior who passed through the impassable to allow us to have relationship with you. We pray these things in his holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen.